Good evening. Uh, I'm Paul S. Schultz, and I direct the Center for Research on Vermont, and I'd like to welcome you to this evening's Research in Progress seminar. Uh, it's a fascinating topic that we're going to hear about tonight. Uh, an early Vermont women's rights activist, uh, Clarina Howard Nichols. Uh, my students were always fascinated when they started discovering that there was a <coughs> woman active on feminist issues here in Vermont in the mid-1800s. Uh, and uh, Lynn Blackwell, who's with us tonight, has been researching not only Clarina's <coughs> career or life, but focusing on <coughs> the speech that she gave to the Vermont legislature in 1852. Lynn earned her PhD from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and she currently teaches at the Community College of Vermont, and she's one of the field advisors at Vermont College as well. So I'd like you all to welcome Lynn Blackwell tonight, and I know we're going to hear an interesting story about one of Vermont's indomitable women. Lynn. Thank you, Paul. And thank you for coming out on this nasty night. It was very nasty on the interstate. Uh, and so I appreciate your coming. And I wanted to thank uh, Kristen for getting me out of the library and going public, so to speak, <laughs> with uh, my work on Clarina Nichols, whom I've been living with for about two years now. And I want to start with this story that actually uh, Governor Kunin, who just walked in, reminded me about, uh, which I think is quite poignant. I went on a trip to Townsend just this uh, month and spoke with the Townsend Historical Society. And they are going to be putting up a plaque for, uh, actually it's a state marker for Clarina on uh, the last Saturday of this month. Actually, it's already up there, but they're, they're consecrating it, so to speak. And one of the members of the society told me an interesting story about how they chose the site for the plaque. The uh, church that Corina Nichols first uh, became a member of, the Baptist Church building, is still there. So they thought it was very appropriate that they put the plaque uh, at the church where she had gone to uh, services as a child because her home is no longer in existence. So they went to the current uh, church members and asked them if they could put a plaque there uh, for Clarina as well as for Alfonso Taft. And Taft uh, was born in Townsend and he was the uncle of President Taft. The church members deliberated and deliberated and they came back and they said, well, we'll take Alfonso, but we don't want. And the Historical Society members were aghast. They simply couldn't imagine why they didn't want Clarina Nichols on the plaque uh, uh, near their church. But they said, no, it was absolutely against their principles. So you see, some things have not changed. <laughs> uh, but to start about my talk, I think it's very appropriate now that we're in the political season uh, that I'm going to talk about a larger story, really, about women in politics in the 19th century. For many years, uh, historians of women have had a, pretty much ignored uh, women in, uh, in relationship to party politics because, after all, they were not able to vote or hold office, so where was the story, right? Well, recently, uh, there's been an upsurge of interest in women and how they featured in various different political party uh, affairs and the ways in which they influenced political parties. So that's what I've tried to do tonight with Clarina. One of the risks of studying a famous woman is that many people already know her story. And uh, what I wanted to do tonight was to build on whatever knowledge you already have about Clarina and to shift the framework a little bit and look at her from the point of view of partisan politics in Vermont in the 19th century. 
um, how did she operate in that arena? Let me start with a quotation from Clarina, which I think will give you an idea of her style of writing and also her understanding of what politics was about in the 19th century. And this comes from the Wyndham County Democrat. She was the editor for many years. And from 1853, one year after she appeared in the Vermont legislature. It isn't a woman's vocation to write about politics. Her sphere is at home, says one and another, and we always say, Amen. Astonished are you, gentle reader. And did you know, did you think, that Mrs. Nichols meddles with politics because she finds their details congenial with her taste? Or for any reason but that politics meddle with the happiness of home and its most sacred relations with woman and all that is sacred and dearest to a true woman. Does this sound like a radical? <laughs> well, this was the way that Nichols explained her participation in what was considered a rather contentious, vulgar, and certainly uh, uh, male business unsuitable for women in the 19th century. Well, to write about politics was one thing, but speaking in front of a male audience was quite another. What drove this true woman to the state house when she should have been home with her husband at the fireside? This was the question I asked when I began my research on Nichols. I knew that she was the lone voice in Vermont before the Civil War advocating married women's property rights and that she had appeared at one of the most, one of the earliest uh, women's rights conventions in Worcester, Massachusetts in 1851. But every time I heard her name announced on VPR, the Clarina Howard Nichols Center, which I know you have all heard, I wondered who she really was and if Vermonters knew who she really was and actually if she had some connection to domestic violence, if there was some parallel that we could draw there. But most of all, I wanted to know why and how she did it. What sort of unhappiness could have driven this woman, woman out of her home and into public? Before I go into her legislative address, and that's what I'm going to do, I'm going to describe the scene in the legislature and then try to back up and recover the personal and political antecedents of her famous address in 1852. But I want to tell you first that she is more famous in Kansas than she is here. She emigrated there uh, with the New England Immigrant Aid Company in 1854 and she's given credit with writing school suffrage for women into the Kansas Constitution. Most of the Kansas story concentrates on this and there's very little uh, in Kansas writing about Clarina's Vermont years. Uh, conversely, Vermonters hardly say anything about her Kansas years. So one of my goals in this project has been to join the, the two parts of her life. The most extensive work on, on Nichols was done uh, by Joseph Gambone, the archivist at the Kansas State Historical Society, and he edited her papers in the early 70s. But once again, he only covered the Kansas period starting uh, with the year that she left Vermont. For the Vermont material, I am heavily indebted to Tom Bassett, who spent many hours researching Nichols for his entry in the Notable American Women. Tom very generously supplied me with all of his notes before he died in a very typical fashion. I've also had the good fortune of working and corresponding with Diane Barnhart, uh, a writer from Kansas City who is doing a young adult biography of Nichols. So hopefully we will be able to see that at some time in the future. All of us who have researched Nichols have been frustrated by the fact that there are very few personal papers, virtually no personal letters uh, of hers in existence. And secondly, uh, the absence of most issues of her paper, the Wyndham County Democrat, 
We have a few, only roughly, I would say, 40 different issues. Uh, but she was editor of it, or she participated in it for at least 11 years. Uh, and so that's a very small amount of extant material. But that said, I am going to make some, try to draw some conclusions for you. First of all, about how she became political. What was her pathway into politics? How she dealt with partisan politics, particularly the two very contentious issues of anti-slavery and temperance. And how she ranks as both a reformer and a politician. Well, much of what we know about Nichols' address to the legislature comes from her reminiscences, which she wrote for the History of Women's Suffrage in 1879. So that's about almost 25 years after uh, the event. Well, Nichols recalled that in the fall of 1852, she organized a petition campaign uh, that was signed by more than 200 substantial businessmen and the staunchest conservatives and tax-paying widows of Brattleboro, seeking the right for women to vote in school meetings. Well, unfortunately, the petition no longer exists to verify those supporters. But we do know that Addison Brown, who was a Unitarian minister in Brattleboro, submitted the petition. And he was also superintendent of schools in the county. Nichols feared at that moment that Joseph Barrett, editor of the Middlebury Register and one of her chief opponents, would use the opportunity to ridicule women's rights and damage the cause. This was her greatest concern, and he was a leader in the House. She was also concerned that numerous women in the city were total, who would, might come to view this were totally ignorant of women's rights, and they might damage the cause by showing their complacency or even opposing what she had to say. So she wrote the liberal editor of the Green Mountain Freeman, Daniel P. Thompson. And Thompson, after consulting with lawmakers, advised her to come to Montpelier herself to argue for her cause. In the meantime, he wrote Horace um, Eaton, the governor, uh, hoping for his support. And Eaton urged the assembly to allow her to speak. When they voted uh, on allowing this woman to speak, uh, Joseph Barrett, according to Nichols, was the only man who refused to comply. But finally, he gave in. Uh, and he said, well, if the lady wants to come and make herself ridiculous, let her come and make herself as ridiculous as possible a a as, and as soon as possible. But I don't believe in this scramble for the britches. So you can see what kind of opponent she was facing. <laughs> Nichols appeared that evening. The men were on the floor, but Thompson had filled the gallery with women. Uh, Nichols was five feet, eight inches tall. So she was quite tall for that time period and an imposing figure as she walked onto the podium. And this is probably how she might have been dressed, with these draperies. And she definitely had a, a genteel bonnet on her head, appearing very, very womanly and feminine. Um, I have one other um, image of Nichols that I think I'd like to put on at this time while I'm talking about how she looked. This comes from the period when uh, she was in Vermont still. This is probably the late 40s. Uh, and this image is quite a bit later. And you can see, um, I, I think of this as a, almost a transformation in her. This comes from the period when she was in Kansas uh, in the late 50s. Uh, in 1859, she sat in the Kansas Constitutional Convention. And in some ways, I like to think of Nichols uh, in this um, pose. Um, back to the scene at the legislature. As she described it, her heart was throbbing. She almost fainted. Her voice faltered. And she put her head on her hand like this. <laughs> Mrs. Thompson was sure that she was going to faint. This is how Nichols describes it. But 
with tremulous voice, she slowly rousted her courage and continued with her presentation. Later, when she recalled this dramatic performance, she said, I hoped to spike the enemy's batteries and win a verdict of just and womanly. In closing, though, she had to respond to Joseph Barrett. And she used this retort. I have earned the dress I wear, but it, it was her husband who owned it. Because of a law adopted by bachelors and other women's husbands. Moreover, she said that Barrett was not acting as a gentleman, given the fact that he and his colleagues, as she put it, had legislated our skirts into their existence, into their possession, excuse me. Well, unfortunately, we have no copy of what she actually said to the lawmakers. But she did send a copy to several newspapers, and it was printed in the Green Mountain Freeman, the Burlington Courier, and Horace Greeley's New York Tribune. Uh, Greeley printed almost all of the women's rights conventions. Curiously, all three papers printed only the portion of her speech advocating the right of married women to own property. None of them printed the more radical demand that they be allowed to vote in school meetings. So you can see there is uh, censor quite a bit of censorship here. Uh, in any case, uh, the remarks that were printed show quite a different story. She was not a femme fatale in print at all. She argued for Mary's women's, married women's right to control property and earnings with very rational arguments rooted in household economics <coughs> that would clearly resonate with her middle class audience. It would protect the community against pauperism. It would facilitate the transfer of family wealth to daughters. And it would enable women to save or squander their resources in the capitalist system just like men. <laughs> and finally, she exhorted legislators to abandon the legal fiction that all men support their families in comfort. Many a man, she asserted, in spite of the legal injection into their veins of his wife's means of subsistence, has proved dead to all the claims of family. So she really had a way with words. <laughs> Uh, and and it, one of the difficulties is that she's, she's so convoluted sometimes in her language that it's hard to take a quote from her and uh, uh, repeat it without explaining the full context. Well, Nichols actually was delighted with the results of this address. At least that's what she says in her memoir. Um, bowing to the speaker, she was rewarded with a muffled thunder of stamping feet. Dan Daniel Thompson said it was a complete triumph. The women in the gallery were all converted to women's rights women. <laughs> uh, rumors that Mr. Barrett would present her with a suit of men's clothes after the address never materialized. And in fact, according to Nichols, it was Barrett who declared, in spite of her efforts, Mrs. Nichols could not on sex herself. Even her voice was full of womanly pathos. So uh, what a triumph, according to her. But her memory is somewhat different from Barrett's behavior. First of all, he edited or wrote probably uh, a scathing rejection of the school suffrage proposal. Uh, he said that women belonged at the fireside and in the schoolroom, not in business affairs or noisy and excited debates. And most would leave the duty of voting to their husbands anyway. A month later, he printed a parody of a young mother going to school meeting in the Middlebury Register. She rigged a vote to hire an unqualified female relative. She neglected her household, and worse, she brought the baby to the meeting, where it wailed so loudly that the mother failed to vote anyway. So <laughs> we know what Barrett thought about women voting in school meeting. Well, what is this evidence? What does this scene show us? And, and what kinds of questions can we, uh, ra uh, does it raise for us? 
First, and I think most obviously, is that the women's right ca rights campaign was as much about gender roles as about gaining rights. Nichols not only faced prohibitions against women's interference in politics, but also the charge that to enter politics, to become a public woman, to demand rights at all, was to become masculine and thereby lose her feminine identity. Much of this repartee about clothing <coughs> is about gender. Though, as Nichols points out, it had a material basis as well because husbands did own uh, their wives' clothing. Uh, why was she so sensitive about this charge of becoming masculine? More so, I think, than many of the other leaders in the movement whom I have looked at. They were also repeatedly mocked and, and booed in the very early years as masculine women. Uh, but Nichols was, seemed to be more concerned about portraying herself as womanly than anybody else that I've looked into so far. Throughout her reminiscences, she tells numerous stories of her triumph in the face of biased audiences, whom she conquers with womanly feeling for female victims under the law. And in her writings, Nichols often portrayed herself as a mother with knitting in hand, a symbol of female productivity. Now, this is not the image of uh, a woman's rights leader fighting for equality. Second, I think this evidence reveals some inconsistencies in our standard histories of uh, women's legal rights in Vermont. Most of them explain that Nichols um, single-handedly achieved uh, property rights for married women in 1847. So why was she still arguing for property rights in 1852? And which political party would have been uh, interested in supporting this issue? Was it a partisan issue? And when did women finally attain full property rights in Vermont? Finally, I think this story clearly reveals Nichols' political savvy. Here was a woman who knew how to organize and use the only direct political measure available to women, petitioning. She knew how to orchestrate a public show of support with other women, and she knew how to use her wit and to publicize her cause despite the fact that even friendly editors uh, drew boundaries around what she was allowed to say. When did she get this experience, and how did she do it? I'm going to go back and look a little bit now at her childhood and try to point out to you the ways in which I think that she came to this place. During the height of her career, Nichols often closed her letters to other reformers with the postscript, yours for God and humanity. Well, this was common. If you've read any of these reformers, this is not an uncommon closing. But I think it, it reveals much about the evangelical roots of Nichols' reform impulse and her commitment to social improvement. She was the eldest child of a leading Baptist family in Townsend. Like others in the reform movements of the era, her evangelical temperament and belief in human improvement gave her a sense of purpose in life. Both her parents were active Baptist, and she became a member at the age of eight. But there are actually very few, ba few Baptists in the women's rights movement. Most of them were Quakers like Susan B. Anthony and Lucretia Mott, or members of the more liberal uh, denominations, Universalist and Unitarians. Uh, Many of them also had um, religious roots of their activism, but they weren't uh, evangelical uh, or didn't come from evangelical sects. Well, like many of these women, though, Nichols benefited from the education and privileges that was associated with the emerging middle class. Uh, and her family, her grandfather, was a member of the pioneering generation in Vermont. He had come up from southern Vermont, like so many others, during the Revolutionary period and founded a long line of prominent descendants. Her father was Chapin Howard. At one time, he was a tanner, uh, owned a tanning uh, operation, a hotel. He was selectman. He was overseer of the poor. He was town representative. 
and he invested very heavily in Western lands, which, was, which were quite lucrative uh, investments for him. Um, Clarina definitely profited from her family's civic involvement, and there is no doubt that her father was quite a role model for her. She remembered Chapin uh, in the difficult role of overseer of the poor, uh, helping poor women, and uh, this is part of um, what she puts forth in her own arguments um, later on. But perhaps most importantly, her father believed strongly in education, and he sent both his sons and daughters to a local seminary for several years. So Clarina had all the ingredients of um, education, learning to articulate her own ideas and to speak forcefully, to have strong beliefs, all the ingredients for true womanhood, except one, a good marriage. Um, her family probably thought she had a good marriage when she uh, married Justin Carpenter from Guilford in 1830. He was a Baptist as well and a graduate of Union College. He was 10 years older than uh, uh, Nichols. He had also descended from an illustrious family in Guilford. His great-grandfather was uh, a lieutenant governor in 1779. But I've pretty much concluded that um, uh, Justin was the third son in a large family, and apparently the genes had worn thin but the, by the time they got to uh, Justin got to his 30s because their marriage was a disaster. And Clarina, her comfortable childhood w uh, ended quite abruptly. Throughout her life, though, she refused to discuss her marriage. I believe uh, that it was the most important experience in forming her character. We don't know exactly what happened. Like many couples, they moved to western New York and they lived for a time in Brockport and several other communities. Um, she was desperately unhappy almost from the beginning and soon thrown into poverty. Justin tried to teach school, he tried to run a newspaper, he tried to read the law everything failed, and Clarina was forced to support the family either by her own teaching or writing. She briefly ran uh, a ladies' seminary in Herkimer and spent some time in New York City. During these years, she also had three children, a daughter, and two sons. They spent much time at her parents' home in Townsend. And by 1839, Clarina had returned home herself and rejoined the church. But what an embarrassment for this prominent Baptist family in a small town in Vermont. Separation, and especially divorce, was simply unacceptable for a middle-class family. Apparently, uh, Clarina's carpenter in-laws were embarrassed about Justin's behavior as well, because they supported her four years later when she sued for divorce, claiming intolerable severity or abuse. The disgrace of divorce and her years of poverty would haunt Clarina for many years, making her especially sensitive to the need to appear respectable throughout her life. Was she a victim of what we would call domestic violence, or was it simply lack of love and lack of support? Unfortunately, we really don't know. At the very least, Justin tried to use uh, uh, Justin probably treated her very rudely. We have some inclinations of that. He probably squandered whatever dowry she had received and then tried to use the little income that she made for his own schemes. We do know that drinking was not the problem because she very clearly says that. The silver lining in this story is that Clarina probably learned something about reading the law from Justin, who studied law in New York City. Uh, moreover, and perhaps more importantly, she learned from bitter experience the difficulty of making a living as a woman. To have her household goods and earnings disappear while her wealthy and successful brothers prospered seemed like a grave injustice. And I think these were the ingredients for a committed reformer. From the depths of despair in 1840, Clarina's fortunes gradually began to improve. 
thanks to her determination to write and support her children. She began submitting poems and little literary pieces to George Nichols, who was editor of the Wyndham County Democrat. Uh, soon she became his assistant editor, and shortly thereafter, his wife and mother of another son. He was 55, and she was 33. But the marriage was just what she needed. Uh, Nichols um, not only provided the love and respect that she craved, but also a platform to launch her political career. When his health began to fail, she increasingly took over the role as editor. Well, there's lots of stories that I could tell about Nichols um, from this point on. And what I've chosen is this one story tonight, but I want to let you know that there's, there's much more uh, out there. What I want to focus on now is how she got into politics and how she dealt with the various um, changes in the political world at the time she was editing The Democrat. At first, she wrote under her husband's hat, as she called it, uh, and from his Democratic perspective. This meant plunging into party politics and occasionally sparring with political opponents, particularly the local Whig editor of the Vermont Phoenix, which was a Brattleboro uh, paper. During this era, most of these political papers were considered arms of the party, and in fact, they were partly funded by the party. Uh, the, every paper you will see carries in the, in the political season the candidates uh, for that party. And that's all. There's no discussion of any of the other candidates. Uh, and so it was basically, a par if you were an editor, you were involved in a party affair deeply. Um, of course, her family at this time were still, were Whigs, confirmed Whigs. And in fact, her brother Aurelius represented the um, town of Townsend in the legislature in 1847 as a Whig. But the Democrat uh, was Jacksonian. Just to summarize, very, very generally supported education reform, workers' rights, opposed any sorts of banking monopolies. Um, and this was a philosophy, I think, that was congenial to, to Clarina at this time, since after she had been through the experience of having to make a living on her own. Her work required reading many Vermont and Northeastern newspapers, and like most editors of the day, she lifted material liberally from these papers. But this is how she also got exposed to the reform community, because she read uh, many reform papers, and you can see gradually over a period of time, she begins to include more and more of this reform t uh, material into the Wyndham County Democrat. But as a woman, it was very difficult for her to write about partisan politics. So what was she to do? Well, she could pretend that she, she wasn't the writer, first of all. But after she wrote a series of articles in 1847 about a women's property rights, it became very clear that she was deeply involved in writing for the paper. And after that, she began occasionally posing, uh, using a pseudonym. In, instead of simply pretending that her husband was writing. Um, she wrote as Deborah Van Winkle from Van Winkledom. And uh, <laughs> there's a number of different uh, poses that she takes uh, or, or stories that she, she tells as Deborah Van Winkle. Uh, but one of them, uh, in one of them, she poses as a backwoods correspondent in Washington who sat in the gallery at the Capitol, knitting at hand. And she described the scene. The Southern members feared that she was one of them abolition women. But John Quincy Adams assured them that she was simply a domestic manufactory come to Washington to represent home interest. And she warned her readers, if they wanted to protect their interest, they needed to send faithful representatives of the home virtues, temperance, honesty, economy, industry, patience, perseverance, and love. Then she described a kind of school books that the congressmen had purchased to help them learn their duties, plus the facts and principles necessary to carry out the people's business. Few of these congressmen had even opened the books or learned the material. But instead, they had sold them and pocketed the money. <laughs> 
And as for Mr. Calhoun, of course, he's the one of the Democratic leaders, she, he was so unreasonable about slavery and the Mexican War, his books were all in the boxes nailed up tight. But this ain't a party affair, she noted. All the crazy members had wasted the people's money and time in quarreling about him. I had no idea, she complained, that men, and well-educated men too, could be so unmannerly and noisy. So you can see in this disguise, she was not shy about criticizing male partisanship that she saw all around her, and at the same time, she participated in it as a virtuous but unsophisticated backwoods woman. But this was the course that Nichols would eventually take. It was much easier for her to express her ideas as a nonpartisan. Uh, uh, but that didn't keep the editor of the Vermont Phoenix from unmasking her disguise and showing that Mrs. Van Winkle was a fraud. He claimed that Mrs. Van Winkle was an imposter, an old maid who cavorted around town displaying her sexuality by kissing in public. Well, this is the kind of charge, coupled with Nichols' sensitivity about her past, that led her to that persistent desire to always appear motherly. It was partly because she was locked out of the political world that she was eager to connect with women in the reform community. In October 1850, she first went to the first Women's Rights Convention. She didn't speak at, at that convention, but she did the following year. Her speech, The Responsibilities of Woman, uh, laid out her theory that as mothers, women maintained a God-given duty to raise and educate the children of the nation. And to do so, they needed equal access to the economic and political benefits of society. Later, she expanded on this and presented men's and women's complementary roles as the basis of their co-equality. And here's one example of how she described it. Now, which is of more importance to the community? The property which that reasonable husband made or the nine children whom that mother brought with affectionate and tender toil through the perils of infancy and youth until they were men and women. But, Nichols claimed, without the vote, women were deprived of power to protect themselves and their children. So this was the basis of her philosophy, and it remained relatively constant throughout her life. It was actually an extension of what many of us in the women's history community call Republican motherhood, that charged women with responsibility for their children's education. Nichols simply took the concept and, and flew with it, you could say. Uh, first, she rooted women's status in divine authority which superseded men's laws. And then she used women's obligations under God as the basis of their rights to political action. Throughout her career, she continued to emphasize motherhood and female difference as the basis for rights, largely because I think of her own experience as a mother. Now this clearly separates her from uh, many of the women uh, who were leaders of the movement, like Lucretia Mott, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Lucy Stone, the names that you may be familiar with, all of whom were much more likely to express an individual rights ideology that was reminiscent of Republican patriotism uh, from the revolutionary period, and to focus on women's equality rather than their difference from men. In any case, Nichols did gain, gain great confidence from her association with this reform community and the success of her speech. It was printed as one of the women's rights series, and actually today I've seen it on the internet being used in rhetoric classes as an example of 19th century practice. It, it, it is excellent <laughs> in its construction. Back in Vermont partisan politics, Nichols had no support group uh, like this female community that she had um, enjoyed so much. How would she turn her beliefs into votes, especially in the view of the fact that she was a noted Democrat now and 
state was dominated by Whigs. Which party was more likely to, em to sympathize with her cause, the Whigs or the Democrats? <laughs> well, it's quite a toss up. <laughs> but judging by their track record, so far, the Whigs were a better bet. They were the ones who supported reform of married women's property in 1847. Nichols had some part in this change, but we're really not sure how much. She obviously was very important in um, articulating ideas in favor of this reform uh, because she wrote a, a series of articles about it. Uh, she also wrote about dower rights three years later, and we know that at that point in time she sent her articles to legislators, so she had moved into a more active lobbying mode. Leading Whigs, Senator Larkin Mead of Brattleboro and uh, Governor Horace e Eaton supported reform of married women's property rights. And in general, Whigs were more apt to use state power to protect property rights than Democrats. And I think this is the context for these reforms. They were designed to shore up family property and protect family <coughs> finances in the rapidly commercializing and insecure economy of the 1840s. Old line Democrats were largely opposed to this sort of intervention. But in 1847, they agreed to a compromise bill that protected married women's real estate only from her husband's debts and allowed wives to make wills. Well, most women didn't inherit real estate. If they inherited anything, they got what was called personality, personal property. Uh, and the law said nothing about that, and it said nothing about a woman's earnings either. So the limited scope of that 1847 law helps, us, helps explain why Nichols was still advocating for property rights in 1852. Very, she felt very little had changed with this first law. In the five intervening years, there were some minor changes um, along the same line that protected women, such as allowing them to insure their husbands, um, providing for an ex exclusion for a homestead up to $500 of a husband's debts and that sort of thing. But these laws uh, were all basically in the same mode. They recognized the importance of women as um, child carers and the fact that the state did not want them to fall into poverty, but they did very little to change women's legal status. By contrast, uh, other states, uh, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, New York, uh, and several others passed laws in the late 1840s that actually gave women separate control over their property. But. Uh, just as these changes were being made, the Vermont political parties were splitting, uh, first over slavery and then over temperance. It was actually this softening of party loyalties that allowed Nichols to enter the political arena more forcefully. She had the biggest problem with slavery. How could she take a stand on slavery when the party that helped fund her newspaper was dominated by southern slave owners. Her opponents, the local Whigs, were not abolitionists either, but they certainly, one wing of the party had been outspoken about slavery and clearly identified with anti-slavery. Nichols probably sympathized with this Whig position, but she was unable to express herself publicly until the Northern Democrats split over the question of slavery in the new territories, and especially after the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law in 1850, which, as you recall, required Northerners to return escaped slaves. Uh, she and her husband, at that point, aligned the Democrat with what were called the Free Democrats. Uh, and this was a faction of the party that split off. And this gave Nichols a chance to express free soil sentiments, which she did. At that point, she condemned the Whig Party for dodging the issue and not calling for enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Law. Then she proclaimed that the Free Democrats were the only true anti-slavery party. When it came to temperance, Nichols was far more comfortable. She was on familiar ground here because she had been printing stories about temperance in her paper for years. Um, <coughs> Temperance was an issue that divided the parties 
uh, more subtly. Democrats favored persuasion, private means, whereas Whigs were more likely to impose regulation to curtail liquor sales. Nichols um, wrote about temperance by printing stories about drunken men and the effects on their wives. In fact, these stories about these husbands who spent their times mostly at the tavern and either abused or abandoned their wives became a way for her to write about the problems that women faced, and they became a trademark of her writing and of her speeches later on. She continued in this mode until the Nichols split from the party and joined the Free Democrats. These breakaway Democrats and the Free Soilers, those who supported the Free Soil issue, also supported Prohibition, which passed in Vermont in 1850. That's two years before she goes to the legislature. But in 1852, there was another round in this big debate over drinking. Lawmakers fought over what was called the Maine Law. The Maine Law was harsher than Prohibition because it provided for confiscation of liquor. And it was considered unconstitutional by many, but that didn't stop advocates from going all around the Northeast and trying to get what they called Maine Laws passed in the early 1850s. Nichols, by openly supporting free soil and the Maine Law, separated herself from the old line Democratic Party. And she joined a middle ground in what was the em emerging in Vermont political culture. In this way, she became less partisan and more of an outspoken reformer, which shielded her somewhat from partisan attacks aimed at the most convenient target, of course, her gender. And probably, it helped her gain access to the Legislative Hall. This brings me back to the Legislative Hall to give you another look at it. Um, not only in 1852 were these party loyalties dissolving, but the women's rights movement had burst on the scene. Conventions in Worcester, Massachusetts, and then in Pennsylvania, and in Ohio had um, attracted much media attention. Uh, there were positive accounts, uh, like that from Horace Greeley's New York Tribune, and many negative accounts of these conventions. At the same time, the, many of the women began wearing bloomers, which attracted expanded media attention and quite a bit of booing and hissing. <laughs> um, the discussion at these conventions moved uh, Nichols in another direction as well, and she uh, lit on a new strategy. She reasoned that uh, single women and widows uh, who owned property were taxed, and yet they were not allowed to vote. Of course, this was a direct contradiction to American political principles of no taxation without representation. And so she s assumed that if leading Whigs would admit that women belonged in the schoolroom, why wouldn't they have allowed to vote in local school elections in districts where they paid taxes? So this was the background reasoning behind her school suffrage petition. But when she submitted it to the legislature and it arrived on the floor, it was greeted with laughter and belittled as a joke emanating from sundry females of Brattleboro. At that moment, the Whigs maintained power in the Senate, but in the House, their majority was threatened by a coalition of Democrats, Free Democrats, and Free Soilers. Uh, and as far as the Whigs were concerned, I mean, they had been holding power for nearly a decade, uh, or over a decade, and this was um, the first time that they had been so severely challenged. It was partly because of the new influence of Free Soilers that Nichols got a hearing, because Daniel P. Thompson was a Free Soiler, and his influence held sway in convincing legislators to hear her. But in addition, Nichols and other Free Democrats supported the main law, and that was the issue that overwhelmed legislators that session. They had been besieged all fall by petitions on temperance, totaling 38,000 signatures, 20,000 of them from women, uh, in support of the main law. 
Ironically, it was the Whig leader, Joseph Barrett, Nichols' opponent, who led the charge to pass the Maine law. Did he agree to let her speak because of her temperance stance? We could only guess at that, but it certainly was a point in her favor. Well, the politics of temperance cross party lines, but, but because Barrett needed those free soilers and free Democrats to vote for the main law. But Nichols' cause did not. This time, Whigs opposed any reform associated with women's rights. In addition to the suffrage petition, um, free Democrats introduced another bill that will allow married women to own their personality and their earnings. Nichols addressed her remarks to this issue because she knew she had some supporters in the House and the fate of poor women with drunken husbands could be tied to the earnings issues. But her address was totally upstaged. Two weeks later, the temperance people brought in Neil Dow from Maine. He had led the campaign in Maine. He was a renowned and flamboyant speaker. And he expounded about the evil effects of drunkenness, which were quite un unusual for them to bring in a, a man like this onto the floor of the House. Well, the Whigs quickly passed the Maine law. But the Democrats, I mean, the, um, the Whigs in the Senate passed the Maine law. The Whigs in the House had much more trouble. They fought over this issue for days. Finally, a compromise uh, was reached. But small town Whigs were furious about Mr. Barrett's tactics. Uh, the compromise provided for a statewide referendum before the law could go into effect. The very next morning, Barrett, who had already squashed the school suffrage petition, succeeded in helping to kill the property rights measure as well. The majority of Whigs no longer saw provision for married women's property ownership as simply a protective measure. In fact, Nichols had reminded them in her columns that property ownership should qualify women to vote. This cast the issue in a whole new light uh, uh, for uh, Whigs, and a dangerous one at that. Moreover, by voting against women's rights, these Whigs could also appease conservative members of their party who were angered by uh, passage of that other progressive reform, the Maine Law. Despite these losses, Nichols rallied and supported the Maine Law forcefully in her paper. Uh, as a nonpartisan, she criticized all the editors in the county for uh, sticking to the fence. And she said that it's time that women come forward and, um, excuse me, uh, proclaim that they were the great sufferers from liquor consumption. After this appearance in the legislature, she became quite renowned in the region and she began speaking more and more uh, uh, around the area. She traveled to speak in churches and various different places. And she gave two more major speeches in New York City in 1853. She attended altogether uh, six of the women's rights conventions before she moved to Kansas. Her career as a reformer was launched, partly, I think, because she was able to present herself as a female woman rather than a masculine woman. Inevitably, this true woman could meddle in politics only by becoming a reformer and avoiding the pitfalls of partisanship. In the 1850s, a woman could not act in partisan ways without being subject to attack and ridiculed as sporting male characteristics. Nichols, who was actually very adept at uh, putting forth rational arguments, emphasized her femininity instead not only because she was sensitive about her past and the need to affirm both her respectability and her class status, but also in order to display her nonpartisanship and to head off that masculine charge. After hearing her lecture on women's rights and suffrage, George Benedict, Whig editor of the Burlington Daily Free Press, found himself greatly pleased with the fair editress though he proceeded to refute her arguments. Not only was Mrs. Nichols lacking none of the sensibilities proper to her sex, she presented her lecture in the same tone and manner 
that a mother would use in dressing her children, eliciting smiles and tears. If Nichols had not shed her identity as a Democrat, I wonder, would Benedict have been so kind? <laughs> in any case, these comments, I think, are a testament to her successful political style. If we, if we look at the broad sweep of the 19th century women's movement and try to place uh, Nichols in it, she stands out, I think, as having articulated a theory and developed a style called maternal or domestic feminism that became popular in the mass suffrage movement later in the century. It was her more conservative argument, highlighting motherhood and women's difference from men rather than equality, that eventually galvanized thousands of women into the suffrage ranks in, at the end of the century. To some extent, Nichols was at a, out of step with her immediate peers, yet at the same time, she recognized how to tap the sentiments of many women. As for her accomplishments in Vermont, I think we could say she opened the debate about women's legal rights and certainly alerted Vermonters to the economic insecurities of women. But the question of women's citizenship in Vermont was a long drawn out affair, as many of you know. Married women's rights to their own earnings were not secured until 1888, long after many other states uh, they were not, uh, women were not allowed to sell their real estate without their husband's consent until 1919. School suffrage was finally achieved in 1880, about the same time as most other northeastern states. As far as full suffrage goes, uh, we prob you probably know that Governor Clement vetoed uh, full suffrage in Vermont in 1919 just before the 19th Amendment was passed. When Nichols went to Kansas, she noted that a colleague feared she would bury herself on the frontier just when she had gained a hearing in Vermont. She responded, it was a thousand times more difficult to procure the repeal of unjust laws in an old state than the adoption of just laws in a new state. To some extent, she was right. Her great achievement was to secure school su suffrage for women in Kansas years before, uh, or two decades before most other states. When her hopes of full suffrage for women were dashed, she blamed the failure on too many old lawyers. Apparently, she not only failed to get away from the old Yankee lawyers, but she also continued to be assaulted with the claim that she was scrambling for the britches. Exasperated, in 1869, she suggested that since britches appeared to represent male authority and male government, they could easily replace the bald eagle as a symbol of the American <laughs> Republic. Better yet, britches encased in hoops would show that subjected woman keeps them in repair. <laughs> Thank you. Questions, comments? What do you know about Nichols that, that uh, you'd like to add to this story? Uh, I, I do recall she said something that she wanted to leave conservative over Vermont. Yes, yes, she right. She sort of gave up on Vermont. <laughs> um, to some extent, I think she also had some other reasons for going. Um, her husband was ill, her paper had died. Um, there was opportunity out there for her sons. And uh, she was fired up by that point uh, by the cause of free soil. Uh, but uh, I think she was exposed also to the West. She went to Wisconsin the year before and spoke about temperance and women's rights out there. And I think originally she was thinking, well, I'll move to Wisconsin. And then by the time she came back, the movement to save Kansas had rushed into the scene, and, and that appeared to be a great opportunity for her. Are you writing the book? Or? Well, I'm certainly writing a series of essays, and it may turn into more of a collective biography of a number of these women. Yes, I still think she's not known in Vermont. She's not too well known, although I'm actually very pleased that the um, center in Lamoille County uh, attached her name yes. 
because it's one of the few times during the day that I hear, that I hear her name publicly, and I hope some people, other people, wonder who she is as well. Well, I'm interested in, in the whole issue of, of these women going west and what happens to them when they go west. And a number of them did go west. Amelia Bloomer is, is one. Um, Jane Grey Swisshelm is another. Um, and I'm not sure if that issue has really been um, looked at that carefully. I know a number of people, actually there's a surge of interest in what this is called the first wave <laughs> uh, movement. and. Um, there's a number of people working on some of these women uh, and you know different angles of this whole campaign. Did she ever return to Vermont? Well, she did. Um, when she went to Kansas, her husband died out there and she came back um, in 1855 and in fact during the worst violence out there she was back in Vermont and she wrote uh, letters to the Herald of Freedom out there uh, telling them how to write the Constitution, which are very good. Um, and so she spent almost a, a year and a half back here settling her husband's estate and stumping for Kansas. Um, and that was during the 1856 election. Uh, so um, she did some work back here. Uh, but she didn't come back again uh, to stay after that. Um, eventually, those of you who know her biography, she moved to California and died out there. And in fact, this image comes from the uh, um, museum in California, in Ukiah, California, that ended up with a number of Nichols effects because her granddaughter was an artist and the museum is, de is, is um, organized around um, her granddaughter's art. And this is in the collection. Uh, along with some other articles, um, you know, a hat pin and a, and a purse and uh, some other artifacts from Nichols. Right in. In which depositories have you found her papers? Huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that has been the hardest problem. Um, the Schlesinger Library has a microfilm that was done, uh, which collected a number of different um, pieces. There's some letters to Susan B. Anthony that are important um, and there's some scattering of stuff. There's a journal of hers that's uh, very disappointing and, uh, from the point of view of a biographer because it's mostly a little literary pieces that she wrote. Um, and that's all on microfilm. Uh, the Kansas Historical Society doesn't have any of her papers there are some papers that are important of hers relating to the Manika Women's Rights Association, which was the earliest Kansas association that she worked with. So in, in that angle, there's something, some of the stuff um, about her activities out there. But that's the big problem. Um, in, in order to write a full-fledged biography, you'd really want to know more uh, about her personal life. And those 10 years uh, have driven Diane Barnhart and myself crazy. Those 10 years when she was uh, married to Justin Carpenter. I mean, we were determined we were going to find out what happened. Uh, and we haven't yet. Who knows? Someday maybe we'll come across another, another clue about exactly what happened. I've tried, to, um, I've tried to read into some of her own stories in the newspaper to see if she's reflecting some things that happened to her, but they're just guesses. So you really can't say, well, this must have happened because she talked about it 10 years later in a, in a piece she wrote. Yeah, but that's sort of the way I came to conclude that this was an absolutely devastating experience for her. And it, what's interesting is that it gave her, as a really privileged woman, it gave her an insight that she might not normally have, have gained if she hadn't fallen into this horrible period in her life. Yes? Well, I wonder if, you know, it may not be such a mystery what was happening back then if, you know, she was, uh, had a disastrous marriage and she was having three children and having to raise them. Exactly. Probably your energies weren't freed up until, you said about 33 was when she uh, 
when she married she was, Nichols. She was from the yes. So yes. Oh, absolutely. She probably yeah. hardly had a chance to catch her breath. Right. That age. Exactly. Uh, I think what I was referring to is is what the real problem was between her and her husband. What he actually did <laughs> uh, was the concern um, uh, that we were trying to, to figure out. Whatever, uh, the family lore um, began uh, in the early years, I think, that the people who work on the, the genealogy felt that, that he had been um, an alcoholic. And then they decided, no, that wasn't true, because there's one point where Nichols states very clearly to Susan B. Anthony that he was not an alcoholic, and uh, not a drunkard, as they, that term was used. Um, and th so they decided maybe he was a gambler. And he could have been a gambler, <laughs> but we don't have any inclination from her that he was a gambler. I've searched and searched and searched for that scenario, but didn't find that either. I think he's just a failure. And he, he wasn't very nice to her. <laughs> that we know from a couple of sentences that he really treated her poorly. Uh, and this is what, wasn't what she expected in life. And that was part of the thing. It was just this, this uh, total um, disjuncture between her, her pathway as a young child and then all of a sudden being thrown into this situation that she certainly hadn't expected. Uh, didn't know that women could have to fend for themselves like this. Yeah. Just as a follow-up, this period, uh, 1852 and 56, were uh, seeing the collapse of the Whig Party and the contest between the American Party and the Republican Party for dominance rising. Uh, would it be fair to assume that uh, when that finally worked out, the Civil War and the uh, abolitionists gra gravitating towards the Republican Party. Uh, for Demir, there wasn't anywhere else to go. But the women's movement probably had to do the same, and maybe uh, she found the Republican Party as a vehicle for reform. Mm -hmm. I mean, three Democrats were so yeah, uh, yeah. minuscule, yeah. and once the war came, uh, they were totally obscure. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's really a, a, a great question. And it's a question for, for Melanie Gustafson, who's written a lot about the Republican Party. But I will say a couple of things about it. Um, she did, of course, the Republican Party was the great hope of many of the ref women reformers. And she did, um, she was approached at one time uh, by uh, someone working on the, uh, for the Republican Party on the election of 1856 to speak with them. But my sense of it is that it wasn't clear to her whether she was speaking for the Republican Party or for Kansas, because the two issues were completely joined. And I think at that point her son had been uh, injured in the violence out there, and she was totally motivated by that and anxious to get funds for leading Kansas. And um, that was part of the reason that she became involved with Republicans at that point in time. Later on, I, I have only tentative conclusions because I haven't finished my research in Kansas, but um, later on, she of course has to work with Republicans in Kansas because they're in control, and she does. And they're much more friendly to what she wanted to do in Kansas. But of course, they don't really help her. And so she's constantly disappointed by the fact that they are going to um, throw up the women's rights um, issues for more important issues, mm -hmm. namely getting into the union. And in fact, that's the real reason that she didn't, or that's one of the key reasons why uh, women's suffrage does not in any form get into the Kansas Constitution because the Republicans were so set on getting Kansas into the Union, and they felt that they would not be able to do that if, if any kind of suffrage for women was in there. Uh, and of course, they were fighting the battle over suffrage for blacks as well. So it, it gets very complicated, but very interesting out in Kansas. And the Republican Party, she flirts with it on and off, but as far as I can tell so far, she never really, once she's a reformer, she's a reformer. And she doesn't want to be a partisan and involved in it anymore. Unlike some of the others who, as Melanie will tell you, uh, got closer to it. <laughs> uh -uh.
Don't I? Yeah, that's a really extraordinary photograph. Isn't it? Yeah, and I don't suppose you have any idea what would have prompted it to have been taken? Or no, maybe when I get out. I'm going to Kansas City uh, in a couple of weeks, and, and maybe when I get out there, I can find out yeah, more. Yeah. yeah, for that period. Yeah. 1850s, yeah. I think it's great. And it had to be because she's really still fairly young. Yeah. Although she was one of the oldest people in the Kansas Constitutional Convention, which is really, of course, then she could play the mother very easily. Because yeah. all these young legislators who were out there, they had come out there to get land and so forth. They were scurrying around with their principles, and she was sitting there knitting, and sh she was the matron of the Kansas Constitutional Convention uh, at age, uh, let's see, what she, would she have been, uh, 49 at that point. So that's probably about when this was, yeah. was taken. So, well, thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you.